So, dear friends, uh, we are going to have a discussion on Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. So, uh, some students have requested that before we go into the second chapter, we have a brief overview of the first chapter by Patanjali. So, Patanjali Yoga Sutra is considered as the main text of Indian psychology. Whatever the uh, Indian philosophical literature has to talk about human psyche, their Patanjali Yoga Sutras are considered as the very, very fundamental text. Now, Patanjali Yoga Sutras are 196 aphorisms which are divided into four chapters. Each aphorism is a very concise Sanskrit statement which talks about human psyche and the way through which the human psyche could be freed from various kind of afflictions or we can say various kind of agitations. So ultimately the objective is Chitta Vritti Nirodha. So, Chitta, according to Patanjali, is an interface. It is like a mirror which can either reflect the observer, the Purusha, or the Chitta can reflect the Prakriti, the observed. So, you can understand Chitta as the very fabric of the mind. And mind is reflective in nature. It can either reflect what you grasp through your senses or it can be self-reflection of the self. Self in here is the, the ultimate uh, observer which is non-judgmental awareness. Hmm? So in this way Patanjali starts. He says, Atha Yoganu Shasanam. Now, let us learn the discipline of yoga. So, what Patanjali understands is, if you take the chitta, the mind, the way it is, it is quite raw and we have to refine it. And for refinement of the chitta, for purification of the chitta, you should take up the path of yoga. Okay? Now, when you say the raw chitta, the mind that is there right now, here, you know, he says that it is raw because it has five fundamental, uh, you can say, agitations, which are not allowing the chitta to become stable. So, if the chitta, get a chair, if the chitta is not able to get stabilized, it is because of five agitations. Hmm? Uh, we cannot call them as agitations. They are the five various modes in which the chitta keeps shifting itself. The mind keeps shifting into five fundamental modes and yoga is a state where it transcends these five. Okay. So the first mode is the mode where you are in the present moment. Your chitta mind is directed outwards and it is reflecting whatever that you are grasping through your senses as it is. Okay? So, I am talking to you. You are listening to me. Completely, your, whatever your eyes are perceiving, your mind is able to see that. Whatever your ears are listening, your mind is able to understand that as it is. This is considered as the first vritti, which is pramana. Okay? The second is the mode where there is slight inner projection that happens on whatever that is perceived. So, this inner projection of on whatever that is being perceived is, is called as viparyaya. Mithya jnanam tadrupa pratishtam. Okay? So, I am talking here and while listening to me, one part of your mind is perceiving things as it is 
but other part of mind is continuously chattering saying what he is telling uh, what i know uh, probably this is wrong probably this is right oh this makes so much sense so there is a part of your mind which is projecting its own opinion on what is being perceived and this projection of your own opinion is actually taking you away from the very fact of what i am talking okay so this state of the functioning of the mind is called as the second stage which is viparyaya here the perception is distorted and partial the third state is where i have spoken for 5 minutes and suddenly you wake up and you see sir was talking something for last 5 minutes but i was not here i was at my home i was in you know yeah yeah please so so that state of the mind where you have completely lost the touch with the reality and you are lost in your own words or images where you are in a completely mental world which has no connection with the fact at all that state of the mind is called as vikalpa so this happens no uh, somebody keeps on talking for some time and suddenly you wake up and ask him what did you say so you were in a state of vikalpa then okay now this is the third mode in which the mind functions it also involves all the imagination that we do about future everything that you can imagine without a substance without a perception that is guiding that imagination that everything is vikalpa hmm then the next thing is smriti smriti is when whatever you are perceiving is not perceived not because you were lost into future imagining something but because you had a complete recap of whatever that has happened in the past as it is hmm? so i recall somebody scolded me in the morning and i am sitting in the lecture and the whole class what went on in my mind is the exact dialogue of what i told what that person told how was the facial expression of that person how he scolded me all that same story same movie plays as it is again and again or i have a very pleasurable kind of a situation somebody awarded me and i again and again i recap i went on the stage i was awarded everybody was clapping it goes on this also is another state of the mind anubhuta vishaya asampramoshah inability of the mind to let go of what has been experienced hmm ptsd you see you know these kind of situations come up this is the fourth state of the fourth mode in which the mind or the chitta uh, uh, functions and these are all the states which do not allow the chitta to become stable they always make the chitta fluctuate and not allow the chitta to get that level of uh, purity which can reflect the transcendental okay this is the fourth one the smriti first was direct perception of the fact as it is pramana second was partial perception where i project and i also perceive that is viparyaya third is my imagination blocks my perception that is vikalpa fourth is my memory blocks my perception that is smriti and the fifth abhava pratyaya alambana vrittihi nidra where the mind does not have any substance to hold on to in all other four there is some substance on on which the mind is holding itself they are all either into the external world or into the mental world in pramana the the pratyaya is when the sense objects are touching the sense organ that sensation is the pratyaya okay in viparyaya my own inner regurgitation and perception both are the pratyaya in vikalpa the pratyaya is the sound and the image of future imagination in smriti the pratyaya is 
the event that has happened in the past, its sound and its image. And there is another state of a chitta, which is also a chitta vritti, where there is no pratyaya for the chitta. But still, chitta is not purified. That is called as nidra. Nidra is not when you close your eyes and you are snoring. If the chitta does not have any pratyaya, Silence, when you are in silence, what will you do? You will observe your breath or you will hear some sound. Then it is not nidra. There should be no pratyaya. Otherwise, it becomes pramana. You understand, no? If you perceive the stimulation as it is, it is pramana. Hmm? So, very scientific. No pratyaya for the mind. Even if the dream comes in the sleep, it is not nidra. It is, goes into vikalpa. Okay. Now, these are the five agitations Patanjali says. And Patanjali then immediately says, Tada drashtuhu swarupe avasthanam. He says, Yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. Yoga is a state where all these five vrittis will not be there. Hmm? Yoga is a state where all these five vrittis will not be there. It means, your mind will not have a pratyaya of sense perception, imagination, memory. Neither will have no pratyaya. What is that state? Which Patanjali says is actually yoga. It means none of us know what is yoga. Correct? Yes. So, best thing, you know, best journey towards yoga is the real journey towards yoga is first understand that I do not know what is yoga. Wonderful. Then Patanjali says, if that yoga happens, what will happen? Tada drashtuhu swarupe avasthanam. If that yoga happens, which you do not know what it is, if that happens, then the observer will be established in his real observer self. The observer will not be identifying itself with anything which the observer is not. Then yoga is happening. Okay? So, immediately in the next sutra, he says, Vritti Sarupyam Itaratra. Otherwise, what will be happening? Observer will be identifying himself with one of the vrittis. When observer identifies himself with the vritti, Actually, the observer identifies himself with the pratyaya of that vritti. Okay? So, this is how the sutra begins. The, the platform for Patanjali Yoga Sutra starts. Okay? So, now, the whole journey after that in the first chapter or the, you know, sutra means a thread that binds all the beads together. So, there are 196 beads in this sutra and each bead is connected to another. It starts with Atha Yoganushasanam and then comes to the very last sutra where he says that all the gunas, when they have fulfilled their purpose, then the chitta has dissolved and the sanyoga between Purush and Prakriti is has become a Vyoga. Complete separation has happened. Now, the observer is established in his real self. This state is Kaivalya. Hmm? So, when the milk is mixed with water, hmm? we cannot make out where is milk, where is water. Correct? The same way, when observer is mixed with the observed, you don't know where is observer, where is observed. But, both are there. There is matter in gross and subtle form and there is consciousness. But both of them have, you know, there is such conglomeration, such mixing of them, like milk with water, you can't make out. Within me, I say, who am I? Am I milk or am I water? I am both. But I can't separate. Can you, you know, close your eyes and say, okay, this is my Nama. This is my Rupa. This is me. 
No, it, it is not possible for us. Hmm? But in samadhi that happens, nama becomes separate, rupa becomes separate. The, the indriyas become separate. The indriya, the, the act of observation becomes separate. The observer becomes separate. Completely, pura, alag alag ho janta hai. Sab kuch. Abhi sab kuch ek saath lagta hai. Samaj mein nahi aata hai kya ho raha. Itna fraction of a second mein that happens that the observer becomes observed. Hmm? Now, if the milk is mixed with water, this is vritti sarupya mitratra. But there is certain process that can be done. Hmm? You can churn it. You can put little lemon into it. And after churning, 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 you see that the milk can become a butter and the water can separate. But if somebody does not have that knowledge at all and once separated, then no matter how much you churn them together, it will never become milk again. Always the butter will be separate. The water will be separate. So like that, a yogi is chitta. Once it undergoes this transformation, then after that, no matter what situation he is in, he is able to identify his observer self as completely separate from the observed. Hmm? Like when a coconut, when it is unripe, the shell of the coconut is completely attached to the cover. Even if you want to remove it, you scrap it, some part of it still remains. But if it matures and becomes dry, then it nicely shakes within it. Like that, the prakriti in a, in a person who has achieved kaivalya, that is the sthiti of yoga, all the observed move very freely within him and he does not identify itself with it. He is consciousness. Hmm? So all of us are unripe coconuts. All of us are water mixed with milk. But there is some churning that we have to do in our cognition, in our existence, that these two aspects of our existence become separate from each other. Why we have to do this separation? The milk is okay, right? Why do we have to make butter or why the coconut should ripe? What do you say, madam? Why moksha is needed at all? First question, I have met many people who say, why do I need it? I am comfortable. In fact, I would want to come to this life again and again. Who wants a complete mukti from Jeevan Maran cycle? This cycle is good. In fact, if you give me a chance, I want same friends, same parents. I want to come back. So first of all, why mukti? Why moksha? Why Do you want it, madam? How boring it would be sitting there till infinity doing nothing alone. This is a play going on, nice play. What do you say? You know what that is. I don't know. No, do you do you want uh, freedom? Do you want freedom from this life? Means in the in a way that the way that you are functioning now, do you really want within yourself that the consciousness and the matter that you are should get separated? Do you want this separation or not? Because I don't even understand what the freedom is. I don't even know as my freedom. Okay. My, my simple question is, you as your existence, you feel that your mat matter is there. You also feel that some component of consciousness is there. They are mixed. My question to you is, do you want them to be separated or you are happy as you are? I'd like to see the consciousness or feel that consciousness. Completely. That I definitely want. Why? Sounds very interesting. Sounds interesting. Huh? Anybody else who wants this separation? You want? Ramaji wants. Hmm? Okay. Why do you? Perspective has changed over years. Whenever we are here, I didn't have that. The experiences will buy no, no. Why do you want this separation of your consciousness from the matter that you are? You are not satisfied the way you are now? Okay, let us give chance to Shreyas and then you can say. Shreyas, uh, please unmute uh, yourself. Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, what I think is there comes a point in a person's life 
when he realizes the limitations of prakriti and then uh, it not only uh, becomes a desire but a need to transcend prakriti can you give any example so a person who has uh, attained a certain level of material wealth society uh, society's uh, acceptance and all he will realize that even though these things have given me pleasure before now they do not bring any pleasure and then he realizes that all the material pleasures have a limitation and there is a need to transcend all of this and if i keep on chasing these things eventually i will get tired myself and again it will create more pain so once all the desires are satisfied in the material sense still there are people who do not feel satisfied they do not feel that the purpose of the life is over and there is something more they want so the happiness uh, for happiness uh, we want this yes what do you want to say but it's not like i want to at attain that state of uh, uh, yoga but people who want to attain i think that is what they mean i have heard a story where uh, 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 raja there will be a king who thinks that he is liberated and still he will be ruling the uh, country and there comes a beggar he says that you are you said you are liberated and still you are using all this materialistic world and you should suppose to leave this and come with me then he takes him uh, with him and in the midway he remembers the beggar remembers that he left his plate in the uh, court of the king then he says okay i left my plate that is the only thing that i have to beg so i need to go get it back then the king explains see this is a state of liberation you still you are in the materialistic world still you live in a detached way though you have everything you are not attached to anything so i think that is the um, uh, no, why? Is, why do you need yeah, that? Is uh, when you are, we are not attached to anything, it makes us free from the sufferings. We are not affected. That you know, whether you are happy or sad, sometimes we will we will be so happy that we are scared. What if this happiness gets over? Sometimes we are very sad that we want to get, uh, get this sadness over, and we start doubting whether we deserve happiness or not. So this suffering has to end, and this is the way to uh, uh, get that ending is to. So there are two answers that have come. Uh, Shreya says for search of more higher happiness. She says for avoiding suffering. You know. Okay, let us see what Gunjita wants to say. Gunjita, unmute. Sir, also to rise above from the dualities of nature. That is like happiness and sorrow. We get too much affected by it. So you know to transcend above them. Uh, so one, one gets should... fed up with these uh, waves of happiness, sadness. One gets fed up at one point of time and wants to transcend both. What do you want to say? Uh, I'm just giving an example. Just like the original, uh, take an example of fish. The fish has to live in water. Suppose it stays on land, it will die over a period of time. Or even if it lives, it's not satisfied, it's struggling. So the same way, our original nature is to be with the Supreme. That is our original nature. That is our home. So the moment we are put outside, we are always struggling. And we don't find happiness because this is not our home. <laughs> oh, oh. So, so those who are happy, they do not need yoga. But, but usually, you know, uh, this is what we observe that when we are in the moments of intense suffering, you know, then we do not want this life. Then, but when we are happy, we say that, oh no, I don't want any moksha. So, so yogic texts say that dukh doshanu darshanam, that is also considered as one of the sattvic qualities. That one should be able to see the dukkha which is not still there, but is waiting. Like jara, mrityu, vyadhi, you know. Everybody will get disease, everybody will get old, everybody will die. For Buddha, this was sufficient. Seeing a person growing old and getting diseased, for him this much was sufficient that no, 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 it is inevitable, I am going to go through it, so I have to come out of it. Hmm? So that kind of foresight, yeah. You want to say something? Huh? Uh, yes, I feel because of the but a patient that life is full of pain and suffering and that even happiness is always bonded. Bonded. Our supreme happiness we know in this life, it's bonded to something. It's never without a cause, never without a reason. So for that strong desire to know our true self, know the happiness that is the absolute peace, which is 
not touched by anything. Not only that, we and material existence are bound by so many laws. See, you are sitting here. You can't go to your hometown. You have to get an auto, go to airport, take a flight, go there. Hmm? But if you are in that consciousness, time, space doesn't matter. You can also go in past and future. All of us have so much desire to again go into the past, <laughs> look at the future. But those freedom, that freedom is not there because we are bound with Prakriti. It is the Prakriti which binds us with the laws of Prakriti. But the Purusha, the consciousness, is free from all these laws. Hmm? So, 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 when we say moksha, it is not a state where you are sitting somewhere alone. It is not like that. Moksha is the very life that you are living right now, but with utmost freedom. Freedom from all the laws that bind you. Can you imagine that you on this planet living with no law working on you? Complete state of complete, complete freedom. So always understand moksha by the word freedom. So all of us deep within our heart long for everlasting ultimate freedom. Restriction is painful. As she said, because our real nature is ultimate freedom. So it is towards that that this science has been developed. If you reach the final state, what Patanjali says, you are in a state of ultimate freedom. Hmm? Not bound by any of the laws. Okay, so how does Patanjali do that? Is, he says that, after describing Panchavruttis, five Vruttis, he says that, how this Nirodha, or how that state of yoga will come? Hmm? He says, Abhyas Vairagya Abhyam Tan Nirodaha. There are two ways to do that. One is Abhyasa, that is practice. Vairagya, that is ability of letting go, hmm? detachment. So, then he describes Abhyasa. Tatra Sthitho Yatno Abhyasaha. Abhyasa, yesterday we were talking about taking one step back. You know, trying to establish oneself into that state of being a non-judgmental observer of everything that is known as abhyasa hmm? and drishta anushravik vishaya vaitrushnasya vashikara sangya vairagyam vairagya is a state where whatever you have heard whatever you have seen all that you feel a kind of a satiety a kind of a aversion that it is enough I am not going to get satisfied by these you know, small, small droplets of water. I want the ocean now. So, vairagya towards the observed. Hmm? That is also a want. Right? Huh? Wanting that is also a want. So, how can you... Vairagya is uh, whatever that you have experienced, seen or heard, it does not interest you anymore. Hmm? You do not have a longing towards that. And there is a para vairagya also that he says that towards all the gunas of prakriti, yesterday we were discussing that knowledge, bias, ignorance, towards all that also you develop vairagya. After that, Patanjali then tells us that when you want to go to the state of yoga, which is a transcendental state, there are there is a transformation of these vrittis that takes place. The vrittis will be there and when you rise higher on the path of yoga, Shraddha, Virya, Smriti, Samadhi, Pradnya. These are, see, initially he talks about five vrittis. These are five, what we can say, these are the five restrictions on the chitta. Hmm? They are the five modes which restrict the chitta, doesn't allow it to expand and become pure. And then, when you are on the path of yoga, these very vrittis of your chitta can get transformed to the next orbit. See, when an electron keeps revolving in one orbit for a long time, it takes a quantum jump. 
and goes into another orbit. In the same way, the vritti of what you can say uh, viparyaya hmm, can become shraddha. Viparyaya on one side makes you doubt everything. Hmm? What he is telling you, it may not be correct. Even people doubt Patanjali, people doubt Krishna, people doubt everything. That is Viparyaya Vritti because continuously in their mind is what he is telling, what I know. Probably this is not correct. Correct? This is known as the Viparyaya Vritti. With Mithya Jnanam Tadrupa Pratishtha. Correct? But even those who say that, no, my Guru has told this, I have Shraddha on him, I follow. They also do not have any evidence that he is so, in Viparyaya, person takes a negative side of projecting something on a perception. You can project something positive on a perception. You can project something negative on a perception. Hmm? So, a person who is whose chitta has more vikshepa, you know, whose chitta is not purified yet, whenever he listens to anything, his chitta will go into a viparyaya vritti and he will doubt. Whereas a person who has a purified chitta, you know, generally in people in rural area and all you see, they very readily develop shraddha. Without sufficient facts, they become a believer. Hmm? Now, this is a quality where from the viparyaya the chitta became purified, purified, purified and reached the state of Shraddha. Hmm? Shraddha is considered as a positive Viparyaya. Similarly, you see that he talks about Virya. You know, now Virya is a state where you show courage. You know, whenever a person has to take courage, person has to take a jump into unknown. When you know it is safe, you will go. Correct? But when you don't know, still you go. Why? I don't know. But my guru has told that you have to do japa 11 beats or 1008 times per day. No matter how busy I am, I am doing it. Hmm? Now here, on one side is vikalpa. In vikalpa, person gets into a kind of a imaginative kind of a state where he starts perceiving the whole world as a threat. Paranoia grows more and more. So everything around the world is to harm me. You know, that kind of thing comes. Whereas on the other end, with Virya coming up, when Shraddha grows into Virya, person starts trusting everybody, even, you know, taking risk and trusting, you know. So in that way, the Vikalpa, grows into Virya. Hmm? On one side, if you take it negative, it becomes paranoia, it becomes very horrible. On the other side, you take a leap of faith. They say, you take a leap of faith. For that, you need Vikalpa Vritti, right? Your ability to imagine what is not in your perception. Now, I told you, when chitta gets separated, you get ultimate freedom. It is all our vikalpa, right? It is not a fact that you are able to observe. You are just imagining it. And with that imagination, you are ready to walk on this path. This is a leap of faith that happens when vikalpa becomes virya. So one is, I have a shraddha on what my guru has told. Virya is required for me to have that courage to walk on that path. First is shraddha. Shraddha is not sufficient. You have to walk on it. Your walking will happen when your vikalpa will become virya. Then the smriti. One smriti is whatever raga and dvesha that I have felt. The more intense the raga was in the situation, the more it will repeat in my mind. The more intense was the dvesha in that situation, the more intensely it will repeat in my mind. But this smriti, can you guess if a person moves on the path of yoga, it will transform into what? Like I told, Viparyaya transforms into Shraddha. Vikalpa transforms into Virya. Smriti 
Patanjali uses another smriti word here. What is the difference between the smriti of the vritti and the smriti that Patanjali talks here towards samadhi? Huh? No smriti, memory. Huh? So, smriti means memory. Whatever that you have experienced, you are not able to let it go. In a you know, a lesser state of evolution. We can say that there are two states of evolution. In a lower state of evolution, these chitta vrittis are there. If they further get more vikshipta, person will get into vyadhi, sthyan, alasya, chitta, bhumi, all those kind of things will happen. If he goes up, he will move towards shaddha, virya, smriti, samadhi and pradnya. Hmm? So tell me the less evolved smriti and the high evolved smriti, how are they different? Of all the janmas, would it be? So she says that one will get the smriti of all the janmas. Yeah. Smriti is inability to let go what you have experienced. Definition is clear. Now tell. The memory of the true nature. So in the path of sadhan, you know. You get a glimpse of some freedom. You get a glimpse of some bliss. You get a... And also, you... Say you start doing certain sadhana. In that sadhana itself, you want to use your memory. You know? So that you repeat that sadhana again and again. So I do japa, but I repeat japa throughout the day. For that, I my smriti should give me my japa again and again in my mind, right? So... The smriti where raga and dveshas are involved is the lower smriti. The smriti where my uh, smriti of my freedom, smriti of the moments that I spent where I felt the sukha of uh, freedom or ananda or the jnana, the insight that I got my mind is able to retain that insight and use it practically in my life. See, there are so many insightful that we have discussed in last 3-4 days. But will your mind remember it when the situation comes? If you have good smriti, it will. You will be able to apply it. I spoke about Swadharma. So many things we spoke. These were insights. But in your practical life, in an evolved state of life, you want to apply that smriti into your life and in, in your behavior with people around you. Correct? So this is the smriti is very necessary. There are some kind of philosopher they say memory is a waste. It should be completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. So not like that. All the faculties that have been given to you, the panchavrittis that have been given to you, all of them can evolve mm -hmm. and take you higher. Then what happens? Smriti became higher smriti. Hmm? Then the next vritti is nidra. Nidra itself becomes samadhi. Shraddha, virya, smriti, samadhi. So as the person walks towards, he is reaching more towards the state of yoga, his nidra will become samadhi. Why, why nidra becomes samadhi? Because in Nidra also there is no Pratyaya. In Samadhi also Sarupa is Shunya. Only difference is that in Samadhi there will be awareness of the Nidra. In your sleep, if you are able to remain awake, <laughs> in your sleep, if you are able to remain awake, that is Samadhi. So, from sleeping sleep, a person evolves into a wakeful sleep. Hmm? And then comes Pradnya. Pradnya is Ritambhara Pradnya. Now, what is evolving into Ritambhara Pradnya here? Which Vritti is going into Pradnya? Anybody? Huh? Pramana. Why Pramana is going into Pradnya? Because Pra Pra is come. 
Yeah. Anything? Perception, so what we perceive directly, this is in the grosser state, it can become pramanda. But when we experience, when we start experiencing higher things, that becomes pramanda, which means we are conscious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think some Prajwal, what do you want to say? Please unmute. Uh, it is uh, pramana because in that state we are perceiving the knowledge as it is. Without yes. any distortion, that's right. In Pragna, what happens? Yeah, in Pragna also, we are perceiving uh, without any distortions because uh, uh, that's why it is similar to Pramana. What is the difference then between Pramana and Pragna? In Pramana, I think... Uh, Still, Chitta Pratis will be there. In the Pragna, uh, there is without Chitta Pratis, we are perceiving. No, Pramana itself is a Chitta Pratis we are talking about, no? Yes, Gautam. Sir, uh, like in after the Tumbara, Tatra Pratis. Super! Tumbara Pratnya. Hmm. Shruta Anumana Vishaya Anya Vishaya Vishesha Arda Swad. Since it is having Vishesha Arda, it is not, uh, we can't, we might have not seen with our eyes, we might not have heard, we can't predict how it will be. It is beyond. Yes. So this is the perfect answer. Please clap. Please clap. So, in Pradnya, your knowledge is limited through whatever that you can perceive through your senses. Correct? In, pra in, in Pramana, in Pradnya, there is a Vishesha Artha, there is another dimension that opens up which becomes a source of knowledge for you which is beyond your senses. How that happens? People in general sense call it a sense of intuition also. Hmm? But how that happens? The mechanism is that in Pramana, the observer who is observing is identifying himself with the observed and then observing. You understand? So, I see you. You know? But in my seeing you, I see myself as this body, these eyes, and then I see you. Correct? But when I reach a state where I am not the observed, but the observer, then I also see you as not the observed, but the observer. And then, because I am seeing my body, my senses, act of seeing and the desire of seeing, everything split and opened up in front of me in the same way you also completely break out and open up in front of me. And seeing you in that depth and ultimately when I become zero, then I get to know your real, real essence as you are. Hmm? So the way I see you when I am observed <laughs> and the way I see you when I am the ultimate observer, there is a difference of the land and the sky. Hmm? Now you appear to me as a, you know, four or five feet figure with color, voice, saying something. But in that dimension, I will be able to see your sthul sharira, sukshma sharira, karan sharira, your whole journey. So I will see you with my pradnya. So when I see you with my pradnya, I am getting a very different vishesh kind of knowledge about you, which is very different from pramana. That is rutambhara pradnya. 
you perceive what you are. Yeah. So this is very beautiful. Panchavrutis evolve into five dimensions of Shraddha, Virya, Smriti, Samadhi and Pradnya. So then he is talking about all of this as Abhyasa, you know, a practice. Hmm? So in the in the process of Abhyasa and Vairagya, he uses all these kind of things that will come up. As you get into the path of Abhyasa and Vairagya, you will get Shraddha, you will get Virya, or you will require them in the beginning and then you will get more and more as you get into that path. Samadhi Pradhan, and they will reinforce each other. Then he says, Tivra Samvegana Masanaha. The more intense you are, the more quickly you go onto this path. Hmm? And this is the path of the completely he is talking about Abhyasa. You know, you do practice, uh, practice Vairagya, practice Abhyasa and grow on this path. And then Patanjali takes a complete turn, you know, in the 23rd Sutra. And suddenly brings a concept, says Ishwar Pranidhana Dva. Hmm? Suddenly says, all this that is happening with Shraddha, Virya, Smriti, Samadhi, all that is one side. Another way out is simply by surrendering to God. Hmm? So, so, this is what makes this text so beautiful, you know. People think that Patanjali is all about sharp intellect and it is mathematical and calculative but Patanjali doesn't leave the aspect of emotion and bhakti Sudden, suddenly he says that all that samadhi, virya, pradnya everything can be achieved simply by doing one thing complete charanagati whatever that you do, whatever that you eat whatever that you you know in, in your life that you want to achieve everything you surrender to one principle in life and do for that. That itself is sufficient. Hmm? And then he defines Ishwara. Hmm? So, so very, you know, rarely you see a text which gives a definition of Ishwara. What Patanjali means by Ishwara. So says, Klesha, Karma, Vipak, Ashaya, Aparamrishtaha, Purusha Visheshaha, Ishwara. Ishwara is Purusha Vishesha. Purusha is consciousness. It is a special consciousness that is free from Klesha or Karma or their processing. It is pure and pristine. In Bhagavad Gita, you see a definition of Ishwara again. It comes in 15th chapter, in 17th shloka. In 15th chapter, Krishna describes the whole domain of Prakriti and Purusha. He describes it as Para and Apara Prakriti. Prakriti has 29 elements, Pancha Mahabhutas, Pancha Nyanindriya, Pancha Karmindriyas, Mana, Buddhi, Chitta, Ankara. These are all Prakriti. Then he says, beyond this Prakriti, there is a Purusha which is unmanifest. So from the unmanifest, this manifest has come. And this unmanifest, this manifest again goes back into the unmanifest. And he says that both this manifest and, and unmanifest, they are there. But beyond them, there is a, there is a third one. That is known as Uttama Purusha. Hmm? So he says, Uttamaha stu purusha stvanyaha paramat metyu dahrtaha lyo lokatrayam avishya vibhartyavyaya ishwaraha Ishwara definition comes in Bhagavad Gita also. Not many people know that. Hmm? So what he says? Uttamahastu purusha stvanyaha. There is a purusha which is a uttama beyond this para and apara prakriti. There is a third one. Beyond manifest and unmanifest, there is a third one which is uttama purusha who, who is called as a paramatma. We call them by the name paramatma. Yo loka trayam avishya. And what this Paramatma is doing? It is pervading all the three worlds. Each and every inch of it. Yo loka trayam avishya. Bibhartyavyaya ishwaraha. This is the avyaya ishwara. 
which never changes, never gets destroyed, never takes birth. It is always there. Even the manifest and unmanifest keeps changing. But the third one is omnipresent, unchanging and transcendental. Tatra Nirati Shayam Sarvadnya Bijam. It is there. It is in this Ishwara that there is a seed of omniscience. That when you get in touch with this Ishwara, the third Uttama Purusha, then you get to know everything. Our Upanishads say, what is that knowledge by knowing which I will know everything in the world? There will be nothing to be known. Not in some contemplative imaginary sense that okay I will get some fundamental idea so I will be able to answer everything. No. Literally, literally there will be nothing to be known. You will know everything. Everything to the core in its very, very fundamental basis. What greatest of the scientists won't know, you will know about matter. You will know about mechanical engineering. You will know about electrical engineering. You will know. You will fly helicopter. Hmm? Even if you don't know it. Everything is known by getting in touch with that. In Ritam Bharapradhyam. So, Tatra Nirati Shayam Sarvadnya Bijam. Where is the Bija of that Sarvatra knowledge? It is in Ishwara. Who is the transcendental, omnipresent third one. Hmm? How to reach that Ishwara? That Ishwara, Purvesham api Guru hu Kalena avacheda, not affected by time. All the Gurus that have evolved till now, from the Adi Shankara, hmm? from the, you can say, Ishwara Krishna or Shiva, and from their Saptarishis, and all the Gurus, Guru Parampara till now. This fellow is the Guru of them all. Guru of all the Gurus. Even Shiva meditates on this fellow. Even Krishna meditates on this fellow. Why? If they are ultimate, whom are they meditating on? Why their eyes are closed? This fellow. Hmm? Ishwara. Paramatma. Uttamastu purushastvanyaha Paramatmetyudharataha Yo loka trayamavishya Vibhartyavyaya Ishwaraha Tasya Vachakaha Pranavaha That Ishwara is denoted by the sound Om. So all of them are meditating on Om. Tad Japas Tadartha Bhavanam With this Bhavana, the Japa of Om should be done. Let us all chant one round of Om with this Bhavana that we are touching that Uttama Purusha Ishwara. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath in. Japas Tadarth Bhavanam. This is sufficient. Hmm? If you do this, you will touch Purusha. You touch Purusha, you touch the Sarvadnya Bija. Your Pradnya. Hmm? So, <clears throat> then he says, Tataha Pratyak Chetanadhi Gamo Antaraya Abhavascha. By doing what? By doing tadjapas tadarth bhavanam. By doing that, what will happen? Pratyak chetana adhigamo. Your chetana, your consciousness which is constantly moving out. Your chitta which always have, have a pratyaya in it. It will change its fundamental nature and start turning inwards. Your chitta which is always exposed out, which always has a pratyaya or has no pratyaya. In the Panchavruttis, either there will be sense perception or my projection or imagination or memory or sleep with no pratyaya. Correct? These are the five states. 
the question was what is yoga then so there is a state of chitta where chitta is not projecting anything chitta does not have any substance but chitta is turning in words turning of the chitta in words pratyak chetana chetana which is bahir chetana becomes pratyak chetana the opposite of that that is yoga that state of chitta that that stance of the chitta to look inwards pratyak chetana how that happens how that happens how pratyak chetana happens when you do tad japah tadarth bhavanam when you do tad japah tadarth bhavanam then pratyak chetana happens and that is yoga so yoga is so many times we have heard no the jivatma touches the paramatma so all of us imagine as if some you know lamp is starting from here and going into the sky correct right? so yujyate anena iti yoga jivatma paramatma connection is what patanjali is talking about Om being the tool where the Ishvara, the Japa, the Darth Bhavanam, there that when you touch that, that is yoga. Hmm? Then happens the first step towards yoga that is Pratyak Chetana. Then Pratyak Chetana happens. Then what happens? Antaraya Abhavascha and also. all the deeper impurities of the chitta which are leading to the panch vrittis they are cleansed deeper aberrations of the chitta are cleansed as it turns inwards and there are nine deeper aberrations of the chitta hmm? so there is vyadhi first itself is vyadhi disease so patanjali is clearly telling if you do om japa with the bhava that you are connecting to the ultimate ishvara your antaraya abhav will take place and the first antaraya is vyadhi it means you will be cured of your vyadhi so patanjali is telling you complete confidence yes person will be cured of his vyadhi by doing tad japa tadarth bhavana Hmm. then sthyana sthyana is laziness you know inactivity samshaya the doubt the viparyaya shraddha will come hmm. then pramada uh, the effort that we do useless efforts alasya avirati excessive craving for the sense pleasures bhranti darshanam you know delusions false conceptions inability to sit still inability to have a stable unshaking body inability to have stable breath all those things will go away and along with it along with the antarayas the vikshepa sahabhuvas what are the symptoms see somebody is having deeper aberrations in their chitta by observing them by asking them by history taking an examination can you diagnose that this person has chitta vikshepa hmm? it means that his uh, antarayas are there and the antaraya abhava has not happened it means that he, he does not have a pratyak chetana it means this is a fellow with bahir chetana hmm? so what are the symptoms the person will have fast breathing shwasa prashwasa you observe his breath his breath will be fast breath will not be stable and slow it will be erratic and fast shwasa prashwasa is one sign telling that there is chitta vikshep number 2 angame jayatvam the person will always keep moving he will not be able to sit still his body will always keep moving if you make him lie down in shavasana something can't lie down still can't sit still or in higher deeper meditation his body will shake so all these are chitta vikshepa whereas when you try to see the psychological symptom 
then this person will have a tendency of going into dormanasya. Dormanasya means when uh, something you badly want and you don't get it. That kshobha, that kind of a feeling that comes. I badly wanted, I didn't get it. So that kind of uh, situation will be there because of raga and the the dukkha. You know? So whenever this chitta vritti, chitta vikshepa is there, there will be no cheerfulness, person will feel sad, person will feel, and there will be kshobha in the, uh, there will be pain, there will be suffering, and there will be irregularity in the breath, and tat pratishedartham ek tatva abhyasaha. So if you want to reduce these antarayas, this vikshep, chitta vikshepas, shwasa prashwasa, if you want to stabilize your breath, if you, if you want to stabilize your body, if you want to cleanse your chitta and the antarayas, the vyadhis, for that you have to do ek tattva abhyasa. Hmm? Ek tattva abhyasa is fundamentally, Patanjali is telling that you have to make your chitta first stable. After stability only, the cleansing and other things and turning inwards and home chanting and all that can happen. So, Patanjali is telling concentration is needed before getting into the higher dimensions of yoga. Eka Tattva Abhyasa means you need one-pointed focused chitta. In Bhagavad Gita, this comes as Ekatma Buddhi, Nishchayatmika Buddhi, which is not a Bahushakha Buddhi. So that Nishchayatmika Buddhi will, will come Tat Prati Shedartam Ek Tattva Abhyasa and then Patanjali prescribes several kind of techniques how to have that stability of the chitta. First one he says is a behavioral technique where he says that if you cultivate a certain attitude towards people around you who are in different situations of life, you will be able to get stabilized chitta. What is that? Maitri karuna mudita upekshanam sukha dukha punya apunyanam It means if you see somebody happy Consciously try to cultivate the feeling of friendliness in your chitta. If you see somebody happy, have the feeling of friendliness towards that fellow. Try to become happy in his happiness. Then, dukkha. If you see somebody sad, develop compassion. Develop the feeling of compassion towards it. But now what we do generally? We show, we become happy when somebody is sad and become jealous when somebody is happy. Mudita, punya. Mudita, whenever you see a punya. Hmm? So this is not something very big. This happens day in and day out in our culture, in people around us. Somebody does a virtuous act. You know, uh, we feel shy of praising them in front of everybody. You know, whereas when somebody does a mistake, we love gossiping all around. Correct? So, Patanjali says, when you see Apunya, Upeksha. This is a Galti Yoga, you saw something, don't, okay, forget it as if it was a dream. If somebody does some mistake, agitates you, forget it as if it is a dream. Whereas if somebody does a virtuous act, then boldly stand out Praise him, make everybody clap. This is known as mudita. Okay, so this tendency of feeling shy, observing somebody doing a good thing and feeling shy and saying nothing, will also bring a chitta vikshepa because there will be guilt in your heart later on. Hmm? So these all the four techniques are there to avoid guilt. If somebody is in pain, you couldn't show compassion, your chitta cannot be stable. Hmm? So, in that way, Patanjali prescribes these four kind of feelings towards four behaviors. If somebody is happy, become happy in his happiness. If somebody is somebody sad, show compassion. If somebody is doing good thing, praise him. If somebody is doing bad thing, forget it like a dream. Hmm? This is one for stability of the chitta. Technique number one, behavioral technique. Second, he comes to a breathing technique. He says, Pracchardhan vidharana bhyamva. If your chitta is too agitated, just do one thing. 
forcefully breathe out and hold your breath outside. Hold. Hold as long as you can. Prana Pachardana. Again breathe in. Hold. Hmm? So, by doing this one simple technique, you can help OCD patients, you can help anxiety patients, depression. All patients, it will work because it has a capability of stabilizing the chitta. So, Mukhadauti should be an even inevitable part of all the yoga modules, especially for psychiatric disorders. Mukhadauti. And that too with Bahir Kumbhaka. Because Patanjali says that it has an effect of nirmalizing the chitta. It has an effect of stabilizing and purifying the chitta. Okay, wait for 10 minutes. Done. Then third Patanjali, so he describes many techniques. Vishayavati va pravrittir utpanna manasaha nibandhini. So he also says that engaging your senses with the sense object in a neutral mode, you know, where you are listening to the sound, but you are not attaching any thought with that, not thinking where the sound is coming from, whether the sound is good or bad. Just holding on to one sense organ perception and putting your mind completely there non-judgmentally. Seeing things without any raga and dvesha continuously. Or listening without raga and dvesha. Neutral listening. That also does tithi nibandini. The chitta becomes stabilized. Or vishoka ava jyotishmati. In the process of meditation, if some one sees a light which is which takes a person beyond sorrow. In meditation, people see a light which destroys the sorrow. That light also, if one uh, just brings into the mind the memory of that light that one has seen in the past, that also stabilizes the chitta. Vitaraga vishayam va chittam or in your chitta, you, you bring the vishaya or bring the image of those who kind of people or personalities who have gone beyond raga. Okay? Say, if you close your eyes and you start imagining about, in my situation, you know, if you are in a situation where you cannot take a decision or you feel very agitated, you just imagine your Ishta Devata. Hmm? So, if in my situation, if Durga was there, how she would have behaved? If in my situation, Krishna was standing here, how he would have answered? If in my situation, Shiva had to give this lecture, would he shake like me? Hmm? So, making your chitta, in your chitta, bringing a particular Ishta Devata, which is beyond weakness, beyond Raga Dvesha, and using that as your self-hypnosis, self-psychotherapy. Hmm? This is another technique, he says. Then, Swapna Nidra Dnyana Alam Banam Va. That is what I said. Just have one desire. Tonight when I sleep, I want to watch. I don't want to sleep in my sleep. People have done in Vidyana Bhairav Tantra complete sadhana of only this dimension. They prepare for the sleep. Doing intense meditation, intense japa. With only one prayer. God. Please keep me awake in my sleep. Because that is Samadhi. And as you grow in this path of Sapna, Nidra, Dhyana, Alam, Banam, Va, the first thing that happens is <coughs> you uh, start becoming aware in your dream that it is a dream. This is known as lucid dreaming. This is the first step if person has progressed on this path. This happened with me once. Uh, I was in US and I was lying down in the night and uh, I think I was reading Patanjali Yoga Sutra or something and uh, with that contemplation I slept. No, I was reading Bhagavad Gita. I was reading Bhagavad Gita and I slept and uh, 
in my dream, I was in my hometown, Nagpur. And uh, there, some discussion was happening between my father and my mother. And I was uh, standing there with them and they were arguing about something. And I wanted to calm them down. And I was doing that effort. And suddenly, in that conversation, me there in Nagpur, pink walls of my house in that room there, this insight came to me, how am I in Nagpur? I'm supposed to be in US right now. I didn't take a return fire flight. I never came back to Nagpur. I am right now in US. Who is this fellow standing here within a dream? Hmm? Then I stopped them. I told them, wait, 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 you people stop. I told mom. You know that right now I am in US, right? I am telling her in my dream. I am in US, right? How can I be here? I asked her. Suddenly, whatever argument that she was having with my dad, she became silent. She became completely silent. And then I told myself, if I just open my eye now, this pink wall is going to disappear. Everything is going to disappear. I was able to tell myself that. And it required some kind of a willpower. And I just opened my eyes and the pink wall and my Nagpur city and everything disappeared. And there was this white wall of the apartment that I was in the US. Hmm? So this was an immense experience for me. Hmm? Uh, Two, three days after that, I was just in that state that am I going to open my eyes now here and open and wake up somewhere else? Can I, <laughs> you know, so, so this is, this is the sadhana which people have explored. There are exclusive yogic paths on cultivating a wakeful sleep and people even are able to you know, finish their karmas in lucid dreaming. I get similar experience. So those who have dead, my grandfather was dead. He came back in my dream. I asked him, how are you now? Now he was dead. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, uh, he said, I am you will miss us. Said, no, no, I am very comfortable there. Don't bother. I was talking as if he was dead. But you remember that you are in a dream and I am in the dream, I know. Yes, I am in my dream and I talked to him. He lived up to healthy, up to 98 years. We were very close and we were talking. Such things do happen. <laughs> they come and I talk to them. I know this is a dream. You know, something that this happened. So, but I, I do one thing daily. I say that this is my last day. Now I have to sleep in. Tomorrow if I get up, it is okay. Otherwise, this is my last day. Even if I die, it is okay today. This I practice, and if I plan something tomorrow, if that if I get up, I thank and execute the plan. Otherwise, finish. That's so wonderful. Hmm? But how do you finish your karma in this So it is just with abhyasa, no? See, I was able to talk to my mom, no? I was able to tell her that uh, you this. Uh, I am right now. I am in US, right? How am I talking to you here? This is all false. I was, I was even able to tell her this is all false. So in the same way, I can continue that. I can go upstairs. I can cut an apple and eat it. So you understand, no? So they know, one aspect knows that it is a dream, but there is certain samskara, which I don't want to ex finish that in wakeful state. I finish it dream. Hmm? Yeah. Or yatha bhimat dhyana adva. Otherwise, another thing that you can do is, as you feel that, one pratyaya you take and stabilize your chitta first in that pratyaya. By any means, if that is happening, do that dhyana. So ultimately, all this is for ek tattva abhyasa. And ultimately, the, the aim is to get that touch of yoga. yoga. So this is how it goes on in the first chapter of Patanjali Yoga Sutra and then there are 
the way that person goes, you know, from this vrittis to those dimension and then beyond from sabija to nirbija, you know, with samskara remaining and nirbija. This is the thing that he explains further in the first chapter and then goes into sadhana part.